on local problems, why this isn't a package, or why you just simply can't take what the school down the street does. The other thing that we really underscore is what's the goal, what's the purpose, what's your outcome? Schools do things all the time without a clear purpose and outcome. In fact, one of the activities we have them do at the universal stage is we have this thing called working smarter, not harder. And so the very first time we work with them, we have them list every committee you have in your school. All right, so we got the social committee, the climate committee, the behavior committee, our DARE committee. We got all these committees. And then we say, okay, who's on that committee? When does it meet? And what's the outcome? And if you have a committee without a clear, measurable outcome, take a big black marker and cross that committee off your list because that committee could meet every week or never meet again. The outcome will be the same, right? The outcome will be the same. So we've got to, in essence, make sure that when people meet, they know what they're meeting for. They know what the outcome is. They know what they're after. It's got to be research-based. Again, we've got to be good consumers. And then the other piece. When I get the chance to talk to superintendents, <laughs> I tell them all the time, do not ask educators in your district to do anything new unless you have two things in the ready before you ask. First is training to teach them how to do that. Second, ongoing, on-site technical assistance. If you don't have those two things, do not introduce something new because you're setting them up for failure. You're setting them up for failure. And yet we do an education all the time. We launch, we have an hour overview, maybe we'll send somebody to check up, but we don't teach systemically like we do our kids. I mean, it's, just, it's fascinating, right? We're supposed to know better than anybody else on the planet how people learn. And we violate it all the time when it comes to adults. Sure, we're more efficient, but we learn the same way, right? We also have to teach and practice and get feedback. So here's the curriculum, right? These are a couple examples. This is an elementary school, right? So they have three expectations, safe, respectful, and a learner. And if you look across those little bullets, you can see the problems. But instead of telling kids, stop pushing, stop shoving, don't run, they're telling and teaching what kids should do instead. So they kind of go through all settings, and then they break it out across the school. Now, this isn't all they want kids to do, right? It's not the sum total. This is just addressing some of the major challenges, issues they had in their school. So as tempting as it is when I work with schools and they see this, like, oh, that's great. Let's just white out Benton and write our school name there, right? No, it has to be in response to your challenges. And yes, there are some universals, right? Uh, hands and feet to self, you'll see pretty much everywhere. And I always say it's a really good idea, you know, kindergarten, sixth grade. It's a really good idea, junior high. Starts meaning something different, but it's still a good idea. <laughs> hands and feet to self, right? Um, the point is this is in response to their challenges. Every year the school goes through it. Is this sufficient? Are we hitting things? Do we have new challenges we've got to address? Um, a high school example, right? Typically much shorter at high school, more focus, and it, again, it makes sense. I mean, high school, you're shifting into that issue where kids should be managing their own learning and behavior, putting more responsibility on them. Um, the, you know, the other thing I point out all the time to schools is um, squad PBS isn't something we do to kids, something we do with them. So they also have a say in voice. We'll oftentimes have a student on our PBS team. Now we excuse that student or parent anytime we're talking about individual kids or teachers, but let their voice also be heard. Um, lots of good examples of engaging students in the process uh, you can find on our website as well as a lot of other state websites. We then look at the non-classroom setting, hallways, playgrounds, buses, cafeterias, and so forth. Same logic, what do instead, teach and practice, but we also look at a couple unique features. It's kind of the overall physical characteristics, right? Uh, do we have too many bodies in too small a space or too big a space with too many bodies without supervision? Um, and we make sure everybody knows the routines. <coughs> and this is oftentimes the non-classroom settings are where we'll start with schools. Meaning they get overwhelmed. They, they've got so many problems they can't even figure out where to start. What do you want kids to do instead? Let's just take on the cafeteria. And the reason we do that is, one, because I know it's one of the few times I can guarantee success because I know I've got those 80, 90% of kids who will do what they're asked to do if we tell them, show them, practice, and give them feedback. 
So that's going to make an instant difference, right? So a lot of times we'll start with the hallway, the cafeteria, for a number of reasons. One, because it's focused. Two, it's not personal. Sure, yeah, let's clean the cafeteria up. It's a, it's a nightmare down there. I hate going by there, right? So that's a way to get, ki a way to get school started, build some success. The other piece that we have kind of come and gone and